All right. I think we've given folks enough time to join us. Uh, I'm sure people will come in as, as the conversation begins here. So first of all, uh, welcome to our September uh, webinar, um, where we're going to dive into the world of OT patching um, and how we can do this effectively, efficiently, and perhaps most importantly, safely, operationally safely in an OT environment. Uh, so to start with, just by way of introduction, uh, my name is John Livingston. For those of you who haven't been on one of our webinars before, uh, I'm the CEO of Verv. Um, I spent about 21, 22 years at a firm called McKinsey & Company, uh, which is a global consulting firm, uh, helping uh, industrial companies and technology companies go through digital transformations. And about five years ago, uh, I joined Verve uh, because I found that as we were doing these, cybersecurity was a bigger and bigger challenge in those digital transformations. Um, and so I've been working with the team here for the last five or six years. Uh, who is Verve? So Verve was founded uh, approximately 30 years ago. Uh, we were founded as a control systems integrator. So um, being a team to design, uh, manage various uh, control systems. Um, about 15 years ago then, our team developed the first version of what we call the Verve Security Center. And it was specifically focused on helping organizations uh, deal with OT security, really from the OT perspective. Um, and it was originally designed in, uh, for clients who had to deal with the NERC SIP requirements here in North America uh, in the power sector. Uh, who had to deal with essentially managing of endpoints from a compliance point of view, whether that be configuration, patch management, et cetera. Um, and so essentially the platform was built to bring kind of the best of IT security into OT, but to do it in an OT safe way using our knowledge. And today we, we, uh, we saw our platform and then we also use a range of, we, we offer a range of, uh, of services around managed services, assessment services, et cetera, um, uh, for the OT environment. So with that, um, I'm going to dive into the topic of patching. Uh, so three topics for today or three points uh, today. The first being uh, the growing importance of OT patch and vulnerability management. Um, and we'll talk more about some of the threats and the growth in vulnerabilities, et cetera. Number two, then, we're going to talk about some of the obvious and potentially less obvious threats, uh, sorry, uh, challenges. Uh, to OT patch management. And then finally, um, we're going to spend most of our time talking about this six-step process that we've developed over the last several years to effectively and efficiently manage these vulnerabilities and patches within uh, uh, what are pretty sensitive OT environments. So as we begin, um, so why is patching even frankly relevant in, in OT? Uh, we have, you know, Firewalls in place in many cases, uh, or air gapped, uh, whatever. Um, and why, you know, these systems really aren't vulnerable. Nobody's attacking them. Well, the reality is that the number of vulnerabilities on OT systems has grown dramatically over the past several years. So this is just data from 2020 and 2021. But what you see is that the number of ICS advisories, and these are the advisories that come out of ICS CERT, um, are growing at ballparkish 30% per annum. What's even more stunning is that each of those advisories includes multiple, or on average, they include roughly two uh, vulnerabilities. Um, and so the CVEs, uh, the number of CVEs, or better phrase, vulnerabilities, is increasing by you know, roughly 45% compounded over the past uh, couple of years. And uh, perhaps even more critically, uh, those vulnerabilities are increasing in their criticality. Um, and so that average CVSS score is jumped by you know, roughly 70% over the last couple of years, meaning these vulnerabilities are more and more critical to operations. And so you know, just the, 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 the basic fact of, I, okay, I always think about my operating systems, et cetera, as being vulnerable, but the actual OT applications, the ICS, the, the, the firmware, et cetera, has a growing number of published vulnerabilities uh, that need to be addressed. 
And unlike where we may have been three or four years ago, where finance, insurance, retail, et cetera, was really the uh, kind of the, the center of the bullseye, as it were, for the attackers, um, now industrial organizations are the center of that bullseye. So as you see, you know, manufacturing is now the number one most attacked organization based. This is from uh, IBM's uh, research. Um, and that growth has come pretty dramatically. Uh, you know, a large part of this is a, is a COVID-related phenomenon with increasing remote access into those environments. But also one of the biggest drivers of this is ransomware. Um, and so if you had asked people two years ago, we asked, uh, there are surveys that ask ICS security practitioners, what's your, you know, what are your top five concerns? Ransomware wasn't in the top five. Um, back in 2019. Uh, and in 2021, ransomware was number one by far. And these, these attackers have discovered that A, there's a growing number of known vulnerabilities, but also B, that the profitability of ransomware in manufacturing is quite high. Because if I can take down your operations, um, you know, the likelihood of paying and paying significantly is, is going to be quite large. And so those combination of things are driving uh, industrial organizations to really be in the, in the crosshairs here uh, of, of the attackers. Beyond the attackers side, we also have a range of other, I'll call it influencers on the need to be uh, executing patching and vulnerability management. And one of those is insurers. right? So this is an example supplemental application for OT cyber. Right, so uh, for those of you who haven't uh, delved into the world of cyber insurance of late, the prices are going through the roof and the coverage is going literally the opposite way. Um, in fact, there is now uh, uh, clear declarations being put in policies that should it be an act of war or should it be attributed to a nation state, it will not be covered, a variety of other things. But one of the keys to this is insurers have discovered they've been insuring OT without really knowing it. And so now to get OT cyber coverage, in most cases, insurers are requiring some form of supplemental application. And in most of those, they are requiring information about your OT patch management policies and procedures. And if you're not actually patching, what are you doing around compensating controls? And so this is just one example, but uh, you know, I could have pulled 10 of these with slightly different wording that would have been basically saying the same thing. And so, you know, it's, it's sort of the, the whole thing rolls downhill, right? More vulnerabilities, more attacks, therefore others in the, in, in, in the environment get involved, insurers, regulations are starting, you know, NERC SIP kind of regulations. We're starting to see those in many other geographies, much more prescriptive uh, regulations, TSA and others are, are, are following some of those, those uh, process, uh, um, approaches. And so patching is, is, is going to be a critical issue um, for those other stakeholders as well. And so what's happening is we're seeing a shift in what are the requirements for OT security. So the growing threats, regulators, insurers, and boards wanting to be able to see how you're improving the security. The CISOs, CIO is now becoming much more involved and in starting to say, well, wait a minute, why don't we have the same level of security? Why don't we do the same types of things in OT that we're doing in IT? Um, but at the same time, having a significant resource challenge. Not, I mean, yes, everyone knows of the resource challenge in, in IT security, but in OT security, it is dramatically more so. Um, if in fact, all of the surveys would suggest that the number one challenge to OT security is not actually technology, it's not budgets, uh, it's finding available knowledgeable resources. And so what we're seeing is kind of these three implications broadly, it's not just for patching, it's broadly. Number one, demonstrate progress. So I wanna be able to see that environment moving from red to green, so to speak. Um, so essentially kind of achieving the same sort of metrics and measurements that we have in IT security in OT. No more excuses that, you know, we can't uh, provide traditional security in OT, right? That the only thing we can do is monitor at the perimeter and, and we'll pick up, you know, uh, behaviors on the wire. Uh, 
those are those excuses are not sort of viable anymore. And then finally, the need to drive efficiency. Um, we, you know, organizations are saying we can't afford to have if I've got a hundred facilities around the world or a thousand. I can't afford to have cybersecurity people at each facility. I have to find a way to get more out of less from a security resources point of view. And so all of those things then naturally flow into what are we going to do for patching? But patching in OT has challenges, right? And, and you know, there's obvious and less obvious, and we're just going to run through some of these. Um, I'm actually, I may, you know, I'll start here. You know, in many cases, we don't even know what patches are required, people say. Um, and uh, vendors are not approving the patches. And, and you know, if I apply patches that aren't approved, that may disrupt operations. Um, it's time consuming. I, I don't have time. I, I have limited number of controls engineers, and they don't have time to run around and stick USB sticks in to patch things. Um, you know, those vulnerabilities we identified, many of them are in firmware. And if I'm going to upgrade firmware, that may require much more complex upgrades to the whole control system. Um, and finally, you know, I'm running 24-7 to, pat to patch something means I need to reboot it. In IT, that's fine, but in OT, that, that doesn't fly. And then there are, there are, there are other ones, right? A little maybe less, uh, less said, um, but believed. You know, first one being, you know, hey, patches really aren't going to stop the attack anyway. So I might as well just monitor it. It's not worth the hassle. Or the last time IT tried to patch it, you know, the production went down for a week. So I'm not going to patch anymore. Uh, or, you know, the famous air gap, et cetera. In other words, there are a lot of real world practical reasons why patching is hard. And then there's a number of uh, stories that we've told ourselves about why and justifications of why we don't patch um, that may not be as real, but are. Uh, uh, based on experience and based on, you know, sort of an extrapolation of, of historicals. One of those that is often comes up is I'll rely on the vendor, right? The vendor really controls these assets, uh, the OEM, the Emersons, the GEs, the Honeywells, the Yokogawas, whoever. And so I'm going to be relying on them to patch the systems up to the level they need to be patched. And, you know, one of the challenges is that oftentimes those miss uh, patches and they leave uh, vulnerabilities in the system, right? So many patches are just not approved, rightfully so. Uh, if you deployed the patch, you would, you know, have operational issues with your control systems. Um, some of these control systems are end of life. So uh, really they're no longer tested for patches. Um, and in many cases, those vendor approved patches or the vendor patches themselves when they do the patching may not include a whole bunch of third party software that you've chosen to install on those systems. And so this chart on the right just shows some of the, you know, the leftover vulnerabilities um, that, are, that are still there um, by using that sort of more limited uh, patch reliance approach. And again, it's, it's not to say that it's a bad thing to do. It's a great thing to do. It just is it's one of the issues that comes up um, in OT patching um, that we need to be aware of and think about how we're going to address. And then, you know, probably the most fundamental challenge is this competing, maybe the wrong term, but different domains, right? Where we've got IT objectives and their approaches, and we've got OT approaches, right? IT security is used to scanning. Right? We're going to scan things with, with a scanner, and that's how we're going to discover vulnerabilities. We're then going to centralize our patch management. We're going to use SCCM or something, and every Tuesday, we're going to push those patches like we all get on our, on our laptops today. Right? And you, you get the little thing, and you reboot, and away you go, or maybe it automatically reboots for you. Um, and they're then centralizing that visibility, whereas in OT, right, it's all about uptime. And you know, we're not, we can't scan. Uh, because once we scan, you know, everybody's got their stories of, you know, PLCs breaking, control systems going down. Um, you know, we need to do testing um, of those patches and not just, you know, push them from the top, as one of our clients said, we used to pray, spray and pray. Um, 
you know, and, and oftentimes that ends up meaning that those patches and the data about those patches are essentially stuck, stuck at the location, stuck at that local pant level. Anyway, so there's a variety of challenges, um, not to berate this point, right? We're here to talk about solutions, but some of these we have to recognize are real. They are very, very real. Um, and we have to deal with those realities of things like you can't scan, et cetera, and find solutions of how we're going to do patching in an, in an effective way, an efficient way, but a way that also doesn't trip, trip the plant. And so that's where we're going to spend most of our time today is really talking about the how. Okay, so given all of those, what do we do? And so we've developed um, this six-step approach, um, pretty basic, pretty straightforward, um, but the devil is in the details and we'll spend a bunch of time on the details here. So the first is obviously having an updated asset list. We'll talk more about what that means, but it is absolutely critical. You can go nowhere if you don't have a really robust view of the assets and all of the risks. And we'll talk about that, all of the risks on the assets. Then identifying vulnerabilities and patches within that inventory and doing that without scanning, right? Without running traditional vulnerability scanners, which could possibly trip the plant and brick devices, et cetera. Number three, then once you know the vulnerabilities and the patches that need to be deployed, then prioritizing them. In almost every case, there will literally be thousands of critical vulnerabilities. If you haven't been patching regularly, there'll be thousands of critical vulnerabilities. And there'll be many patches that are not able to be deployed, at least immediately. And so the next step is to re re review those site, those uh, patches, review your risks, and prioritize those that really need to be addressed quickly. Then developing remediation plans for those. Okay, so how are we going to do the patching? And importantly, and you're going to hear this a lot today, working on mitigation plans. Because patching cannot... There is no such thing as just patching in OT. We have to think about patching integrated with the rest of the mitigating controls that we can take because there will always be patches that cannot be deployed. We then test them um, and eventually deploy and then finally demonstrate uh, and document that the patches have been applied or alternatively, the mitigations have been applied and they are uh, in place. And just some, some more color on that. So I mentioned the, the baseline inventory, having that what we call a 360 degree view. So we're gonna talk about that today. Um, identifying those vulnerabilities and patches without scanning. So in an OT safe manner um, and understanding the compensating measures that are possible for those patches. So if I can't deploy it, what else could I do? On the review side, making sure we have those lists of vendor approved patches um, and understanding which ones are most critical and which aren't. On the remediation plan then, um, we tend to follow the now, later, never. So there are some patches which need to be deployed now. We have to get them out now. For instance, the WannaCry patch after, uh, after that, uh, um, you know, the WannaCry uh, attacks were identified. We needed to get that done now. There are some things that we can do later. And then there are going to be some patches that we probably will never be able to deploy unless we do a whole control system upgrade. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the mitigating plan. So what is our mitigation? What are our compensating controls that we can use? Testing, we're going to spend a bunch of time on testing, but then in the deploy piece, actually executing deployment and what we refer to as act locally. So a lot of what we're going to talk about is being able to think globally. So pulling data to the top, driving efficiency. But then when we start to take actions and deploy those patches, making sure that that's done locally or locally may not, may not be a physical proximity. But what we mean by that is someone who understands that physical process, understands when there are outages, understands the control systems. Uh, so we're not just sitting at the top, pushing patches into our... OT environments. And then finally documenting and being able to monitor on an ongoing basis. So I mentioned the, this notion of think global, act, uh, or sorry, think global, act local. So I'm just going to spend a little time on this because it is really, as we think about those six key steps, it is a core principle that we're going to come back to. So what think global, act local basically means is 
we are going to take that asset inventory, that 360 degree view of the risks, all of that from an individual location, a plant, a substation, whatever is, you know, a, a distribution facility, whatever it is. And that data gets pulled up or better phrase pushed up to the top so that a small team of scaled um, analysts can uh, analyze the vulnerabilities, analyze the patches that need to be deployed, build playbooks of what patches need to be deployed, et cetera. And we can drive scale in this. And then similarly, or sorry, and, but, but when we wanna go act, i.e. we wanna go take actions, we wanna, we wanna patch something, or alternatively, we wanna take mitigation actions like hardening config or you know, a- executing application whitelisting. Those actions are then pushed out to a local or, or someone who understands that operation so that those people can be involved before the action happens. This is how, in our view, we bring IT and OT together, right? This quote unquote convergence that everybody talks about. Organizationally, we think there's a great way to scale, drive efficiency, get the people who really understand vulnerability management involved. But then before we take an action, people who have you know, plant IT, process control knowledge being involved. Obviously in some very, very large organizations, global, you probably have some sort of a regional subject matter expert in there. But this principle is kind of core in our view to being able to get patching right. And it delivers a bunch of benefits. So number one is lower labor costs, right? So because I can pull that data out from individual sites, I can scale the planning, I can scale the prioritization, I don't have to train 100 people in cybersecurity. Um, number two, it's operationally safe, right? So I can do this and ensure that I'm not going to be patching something uh, while you know this. I'm not rebooting a, a, a an HMI while the control system is operating, for instance. Um, third. This approach gets us down into all of the information about the assets and gets that 360 view, right? So I can actually really see deep into the environment. Um, so I can make those trade-offs, those mitigations, and that's really in that better risk management. I can start to make trade-offs. And then finally, this approach allows us to take relatively quick response actions, right? So because I can patch, I can harden configs, I can manage users and software, I can then not only know that, okay, I need to patch, but I can actually execute uh, that patch as well. So how do we do this? We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about Verve specific today. Um, we're going to use some dashboards from our platform just because it's, the, in our view, the, the easiest way to explain what we're talking about in this. Um, but the way that we've thought about it um, helps, the way we thought about patching is built into the platform. So it helps understand how we think about patching to start with that, right? So the platform, in our case, brings together all of that asset data, right? Gathers all that inventory about the the assets, the software, et cetera, and allows us to then do things like vulnerability management without having to scan. Um, And so by getting that detailed list of all the assets, all the software, all the patches, all the firmware, we can then analyze that for known vulnerabilities. We can look at that and say, okay, here's the here are the patches that are missing. Not just knowing the OS version, you know, on the system, but literally knowing every KB that's been deployed. Similarly, as we start to move beyond, you know, applying a patch, but to the mitigating controls, being able to look at configurations, because a lot of times our our best path to remediating or mitigating a risk is to harden a config rather than to deploy the patch because it may not be deployable at that time. Similarly, users and accounts, right? I, I may be able to harden a device by just really limiting the access to that device. Anti-malware, whitelisting, et cetera, a, a great way of potentially offering mitigation to patching, um, to a patch, not to patching more broadly, but to a patch. So we bring that into the platform as well so we can assess whether there's a mitigation um, that's available until I can patch. Similarly, intrusion detection, so monitoring to know if someone's starting to to, uh, exploit that particular vulnerability. And then finally, the incident response piece, and that is particularly around backups. So knowing if I'm ready to respond 
do I have an updated backup? And by the way, that's that's both true from a threat point of view, but it's also true for patching, right? So I don't want to start patching things until I know for sure that I have a backup. And so this platform, you know, was built essentially to address this problem of, all right, I got a patch, but I'm not going to be able to deploy a patch every time. So how do I bring all of those mitigating measures into effect uh, and do it in, a, in an OT safe way? So the second key principle to that overall six step process is this 360 degree view of risks. And so what you'll see at the top right of most of these pages is we're gonna track our way around those six steps. So now we've kind of laid the foundation. We're gonna work our way around those six steps. So the first is to really have a deep view of this 360 view risk. And so, as I mentioned a couple of times, right? It's, it's knowing vulnerabilities, it's knowing patches, it's knowing configurations, it's knowing users and accounts, et cetera, et cetera, network protections, and, and eventually also knowing the asset criticality because that helps us know how to prioritize our patching. And so it allows us to prioritize resourcing. Um, as we said before, right? We don't, you know, the number one uh, gap is resources. So how do I make sure I can, I can prioritize and reduce the amount of resources I need? Um, you know, if protection isn't possible, if I'm not able to patch, how do I stop the spread um, through mitigating controls? Um, how do I address insecure by design assets? So, so there may be assets that don't actually, it's not a patch, but it's just insecure, right? That device was insecure by design. So then I can address that through other mitigating measures, et cetera. The point here is patching when we talk about an end-to-end -end patch management process, it can't just be patching. It has to think about what are the various forms of mitigation because there will always be those patches that I cannot deploy. And this 360 view starts you off on the right, the right foot. To get there then, you have to go deep. It's, it's not enough to know, oh, great, I know the OS version of that, of that Windows device. Or I know that you know, the firmware is X on that PLC. Um, it's critical to get into the weeds of this. Um, OS version doesn't always indicate patch status. Um, we need to understand those mitigations. Is, is AV up to date? Is whitelisting, is it in lockdown mode? We need to know the, the configs of these devices to know, okay, I can't patch it, but I'll harden that config. And, or, or maybe that config is already hardened and I can use that. I need to know network device configurations, not just what's flowing today, but what could flow, right? What are the rules in that firewall? So great, my, my, the, the reason I'm not gonna patch or the, the, the mitigation I have for patching that device is it's behind a firewall. Oh, great, if that firewall has got an any any in it or multiple other insecure rules, you know, it's really not providing the protection that you're expecting and on down the list. But the whole point here is the first step in this is you have to see deep. You have to get all the way to the bottom of the ocean um, so you can know about uh, not just the, the true view of patching, but the other elements as well. One of the things that we often start with is just the basic software list. So we'll pull back all of the application software, the OS, the firmware, et cetera, from an environment. And one of the quickest ways to solve the quote unquote patching problem is to make the patch go away by removing the software. Often what we'll find is we'll go into an environment and people say, yeah, the vendor doesn't allow us to put any other software on the system. And we do our discovery and we pull it back and we find, oh really? So, you know, you've got angry IP scanners, you've got Nmap, you've got, you know, iTunes, all sorts of things. Um, that, are not required for operations that just create risks and frankly patches that may need to be applied if that software is going to remain on the system. So the first thing we can do to solve patching is to remove the software. And we've just wiped out a whole bunch of patching requirements. Um, so that's the first thing we do. We always get that software inventory and we look through it for things that are either risky or alternatively just really unnecessary um, in, the, in the OT environment. And that comes from you know, having been doing this for 30 years, but also folks, the control systems engineers themselves um, have a great insight to what doesn't really belong on that system.
Then as we move from that top piece, which is identifying you know, the assets and getting deep, et cetera, we move into, okay, now we need to start looking at identifying what vulnerabilities exist and what patches exist. And so the way we think about this then is to use that data we've just gathered to be able to identify vulnerabilities using, you know, the National Vulnerability Database, MITRE, other known, uh, you know, databases, uh, as well as some of our own work around vulnerabilities, where we can identify vulnerabilities by asset type. Um, and then be able to overlay things like the impact of those vulnerabilities. So is it availability? Is it integrity, et cetera? And eventually being able to get to, okay, so I want to see all my assets and I'm going to take the CVSS scores of those, of those vulnerabilities and see which are my most exposed assets, right? Which assets are those that have the greatest um, uh, number of vulnerabilities or, or total risk of vulnerabilities? By the way, not to say that that's the only way you want to look at it, it's just one angle, um, but it starts to get at, okay, which assets, where do I want to start to focus? And then, you know, we can use things like ISA 99, which has a, an, an approach they've laid out, which is a very good approach. It actually mirrors a lot of those, um, you know, kind of some of those six steps and, 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 and how we think about it. But, you know, identifying if they exist, analyzing the risk, and then deciding, okay, this one actually really needs to be done quickly or not. And a lot of that comes down to um, how we prioritize those vulnerabilities. And so what we tend to do is we'll start with, okay, so now we know which assets are most at risk, which ones have the greatest number of vulnerabilities, you know, et cetera. But then let's take that down to another level because literally that gives us thousands or maybe tens of thousands of vulnerabilities to deal with. And so the first thing is to focus on which CVEs have a lot of exploits. So there are a number of public data sources around exploits. Um, and so we bring those in so that we can overlay that on the vulnerabilities, whether it be the CISA list, which is a great list or others. Um, and then we start to drill down. So we say, okay, these are the ones with the most exploits, but then are they critical assets? So we really want to focus on those assets that are critical. Do they have compensating controls? In other words, is application whitelisting in lockdown? Is it behind a firewall? Does that firewall have robust protections, et cetera? And eventually coming down to, okay, there are 308 vulnerabilities on assets where we have very minimal compensating controls and, who's, uh, and those assets are actually critical assets. So again, this is just one example, but the whole point here is in patch management is prioritize, prioritize, prioritize. You're gonna have lists of thousands of vulnerabilities and so getting those down to a, a reasonable, manageable set is critical. And obviously, as you start to move through this, seeing the, uh, the firmware as well as the application software in the OS is critical, right? So understanding how many devices of different types and what are the vulnerabilities uh, that exist in those assets is equally critical uh, to all of the traditional uh, OS type devices. So we've been talking about vulnerabilities and prioritizing those. Then of course, patches will relate to those vulnerabilities, right? And so as we look through for the patches, we'll then try to say, okay, as we think about those patches, we'll prioritize the critical ones similarly. Um, and we'll look at those and when they were released, to make sure we're able to maintain our pace, so to speak, and that we are patching on a relatively frequent basis. Um, and then we can gauge it, right? Are we, are we you know, making progress? Or are we not making progress against those patches? Um, but the point here is we, we sort of pivot from being able to look at the vulnerabilities, say, okay, now what patches are gonna address those vulnerabilities? The reality though is that sometimes <laughs> it's not quite that easy. Um, and so Log4j is a great uh, example of where, you know, we have to create a slightly different approach to identifying how to patch that particular vulnerability. And so in our case, what we did is we took sort of three or four different angles on identifying the vulnerability that existed. 
identifying whether that vulnerability existed. So we looked for you know systems where we detected. So we built a, a, a vulnerability, essentially detection tool within our platform that we then distributed out uh, to our clients. And that allowed them to look for using our uh, essentially OT safe discovery tool or scanner tool of where that log4j uh, system was. We would then look for things like um, uh, Java process activity uh, systems with Java runtimes on them, et cetera. And so by looking at these multiple angles, we were able to find systems that were most likely vulnerable to that particularly unique vulnerability and then, and then potentially prioritize that to act on. It's just a special case of, again, what makes it tricky in OT. Um, and frankly, even in IT, Log4J was pretty tricky. But the need to be able to have some form of platform where you can quickly deploy a new um, discovery tool uh, to find some of these new vulnerabilities. So similarly, in the, in the overall uh, you know, prioritization efforts and, and, uh, and, and making sure we know where we are in our journey is to be able to track how are we doing. Um, and are we making uh, timely progress around patching? And so this is one of our dashboards we use around NERC SIP, but, but many of the regulations are looking at similar kinds of data around how frequently are you patching? And so by monitoring, you know, how many patches uh, are older than 35 days, or you could do it at 20 days if you wanna get earlier on it, you know, how many critical patches are we missing? that are older than 35 days. Okay, well, we then have a compliance issue um, in some environments with that. Um, and so again, this is all about how do I think about monitoring and maintaining my, my view of which vulnerabilities and patches are most critical. And then as we start to prioritize even further, we're gonna prioritize based on um, asset, at the top, right? Which, which are the assets that have the most patches? And then one of the things that we often do is we'll do an 80-20, right? So if I were to deploy, this is on the bottom left, right? I were to deploy certain of these patches, it will address a certain number of those vulnerabilities. And we can start to think about an 80-20. Well, geez, if I could just apply these 15 patches or 10 patches on these devices, I'd knock off you know, 40, 50% of my critical vulnerabilities. Um, and again, it's just another way of cutting the information to be able to prioritize these limited time we have. And then similarly, looking at the right here of, okay, and I'm really gonna focus on those that the vendor has approved um, and, and not, you know, get all bent out of shape because, okay, there's a bunch of these that the vendor hasn't approved. I'll know that those vulnerabilities exist, but I'm gonna focus on those that are, that are approved. And so at the end of the day, you know, what we're kind of saying with all of this is establishing a criticality to help us prioritize these patches, starting with, okay, so what is the type of asset? Is it a safety system? Uh, is, it a, is it something that's a non-critical uh, system? You know, what's the criticality of the component itself to that system? Is it a, does it control a critical process or not? And then looking at the risks. Right, so what's the vulnerabilities? What are the missing patches, um, et cetera? And that gives us, you know, essentially an unmitigated score. So what is the risk score of that asset before we've done anything? And then we can look at, okay, what have I done? I've remediated, I've mitigated, I've put compensating controls in place. And at the end of the day, I'll come out with a risk score. And while we focus on patching and patching is kind of one of the key elements of this, you really can't do patching in a silo. You really need to think about patching within the overall risk score, particularly in OT, given the, the limitations in many cases of being able to deploy those patches quickly. Okay, so now we've prioritized. Um, we've put together our 80-20 list. We know the, the devices that we want to go after. Okay, how do we actually go do that? And so the first step is to develop remediation and mitigation plans. So mitigation plans, um, so remediation is relatively straightforward and we'll come back to that, but around you know, patching and deploying patches, et cetera. 
Um, we're going to come back to how we do that in terms of testing and all the rest, but also putting together for those patches, which, which are not that quote unquote now category. They may be later, they may be never. You need mitigate, mitigation plans. So working through what are our alternatives? Okay, I have application whitelisting. Okay, that's an alternative. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about, about that as we go. Updating AV signatures, um, the network protection. So I have a firewall. Is that firewall really locked down? Um, or is there some dual NIC that's routing around that firewall? Um, okay, I can take configuration hardening measures. I can shut down ports and services. I can um, manage users. I can manage access control, et cetera. And then assign that mitigation uh, to the asset and the timing until that mitigation will be resolved in favor of a patch. So at some point, we're gonna wanna patch that system. And so we need to put a date to it and say, by this date, we're going to, we're going to actually patch it and that mitigation will no longer be what we're relying on. Fourth is to monitor that mitigation measure. We're gonna talk a little bit more about monitoring, but it's critical if we're going to use a mitigating measure that we know it and we know that it's still in effect, right? Okay, if we're gonna use whitelisting, do we know that it's still in lockdown? Do we know that changes have been made to that whitelist to expand the number of applications? And then finally, to eventually resolve it and uh, at appropriate time. So a quick note on application whitelisting, and I know it's not an application whitelisting webinar, but again, it's critical to how we do patching because oftentimes um, a patch is designed to you know, stop a malware from effectively spreading or operating. Um, and AV is oftentimes difficult in OT, right? We all know the issues with trying to update signatures. Sometimes those signatures aren't approved by the vendor. It takes a while. Um, and so, and the other piece is, the good news is, OT environments are more stable than IT. Application whitelisting has really been tough to, to maintain in IT. So it's kind of fallen by the wayside. But in OT, we don't want things to change. So, um, and in fact, DHS found a couple of years ago that if you deployed application whitelisting, could have stopped almost 40% of the actual incidents they found over a couple of year period of time. So, and, and it can be done safely in OT. Um, we've been doing it for, you know, probably 12, 13 years. If you deploy it the right way and you ensure that you know which apps are need to run it, you know, they may not be running today, but we know they need to run over the next three to six months because of, you know, something, some process that runs only occasionally. But the point here is it, it can be deployed and it is a great mitigating measure if you can't patch a system. Another mitigating measure is compliance, is configuration compliance. Um, and so one of the things you'll want to do in any um, patching process is actually also to look at your configurations because it may be that you can't patch something, but if you were to execute configuration hardening, you could mitigate or create a compensating control for that patch. And in fact, if you look at a lot of the vulnerabilities, those ICS advisories I talked at the beginning, many of them don't have a patch yet. Maybe they're never gonna have a patch. And so the only way to really protect the system is to deploy some form of configuration hardening on that system. And so this chart is just a way of showing you know, monitoring whatever it is that is your hardened image, so to speak, and making sure that that device um, at any given time is green and not red, right? So across the bottom here, you have uh, the various compliance configuration items that you want to be compliant with and whether, you know, devices are compliant or not with that. And this allows us to see, A, is, it, is that mitigation in place and then monitor that over time. But at some point, as I mentioned, you actually have to patch. <laughs> so we've talked a lot about mitigations, et cetera, but okay, how do we actually then go and take the action to actually deploy patches? Um, and so the first step is in that wheel up on the right-hand side, right? It's test and deploy. The first step is testing. Uh, the first step in that journey is to get the approved patch lists from the OEMs. Um, one of the keys you know, to this is that the OEMs are testing these patches. Uh, and they're reviewing them and getting that list is key and importing that list, frankly, into whatever tools you're using. So you know what's approved. And also importantly, 
knowing what's not been approved. Um, oftentimes you may just get the approved list and you don't get the unapproved list. And so you're left with a lot of those vulnerabilities if you just use the approved list. So then comparing to the known vulnerabilities to understand what's missed, downloading then those approved patches in some safe zone, uh, a proxy, a DMZ, um, obviously it depends on the network architecture, whether you have access or you need to use, use uh, sneaker net to you know, take a USB across, uh, et cetera. Ensure that the patch that you've received uh, is the actual one from the vendor. Um, we have obviously lots of stories of man in the middle attacks coming through patches. Um, and so ensuring that the hash value uh, matches with what came from the vendor. Uh, testing those patches on non-critical system. We typically, in our process, will let that soak for call it 24 hours um, on a non-critical system, even if it's proved, right? Uh, to make sure that nothing is disrupted. Then sixth, make sure all of the devices that are intended to be patched are backed up recently. This is a step that is often overlooked. It is one of the keys to, as I said earlier, about having that visibility of patch status in that platform so that we know, okay, before we patch, yep, it's got an updated backup, or if not, we make sure that backup gets updated. And then finally, continue deployment across the devices um, by criticality and approval rating, and then eventually confirm the patch and update the baselines. So this is, you know, uh, I'm sure many of you have similar kinds of steps in your process. This is sort of the the process steps that we have found to be effective in ensuring that we both can deploy patches, but also make sure that we're not tripping plants in, in the process. One of the keys to that think global, act local approach I talked about before though, when I mentioned low cost, uh, lower labor costs and resourcing is the ability to automate that endpoint remediation or the endpoint patch deployment um, rather than just rely on manual working around machine to machine. So um, oftentimes what happens is there's a list of patches to be deployed. Maybe it's given on a USB stick or something and a technician needs to go around and, and essentially insert that USB stick in each, in each device. Um, and what we have found that is that if you create this think global act local architecture, you can actually use automated patching, not from the top, but in that act local piece, right? So the, you can create playbooks and distribute those to people who understand that control system. They then can select when and, uh, and, and when, sorry, when and which devices should be patched and they can click it and those patches can be deployed. Obviously doing it through that staged approach I just talked about, right, of testing and then deploying more broadly. But what this allows is the ability to get to scale and not have, um, you know, days go on uh, in the patching process. Um, and it, but it puts that control in the hands of the OT practitioners rather than having this all done centrally and possibly tripping the plant. So the next, you know, the final step of the, of the process is to actually track it, to document, to see how we're doing. Um, so this is an example of monitoring vulnerabilities in real time. So, okay, on a daily basis, how are we doing? Uh, are our vulnerabilities going up? Are they going down? Are we patching more things? Are we not? Um, and as I showed before on that NERC SIP dashboard, you know, what's the aging of those patches that haven't been deployed to make sure that we're doing this on a timely basis? Um, and by the way, monitoring not just patches and vulnerabilities, but those mitigating measures that we have in place. So making sure that if for some reason, our application whitelisting that we're using as a mitigating measure moves out of lockdown mode, we see that and we go put it back into lockdown mode. Or if a network config changes, we see that uh, so that we know that that mitigating measure is now not um, as strong as it was when we started. Um, and so this monitoring and, and, and documenting beyond just the patch, but looking at all the mitigating measures is, is pretty key. And at the end of the day, we have found this process, you know, saves about 30% in the assessment and prioritize phase. Um, and about 70% when you include all the remediation and actual deployment phases. 
Um, and that's because in large part, the labor costs are significantly lower when you can use an approach like this to go after patching, patching and mitigating patches um, in this think global, uh, act local type, type of an approach. So to quickly summarize again, what is that six step approach? And, and there is a, a white paper we have on this as well that you can download and we'll also be obviously sending out this recording as well as the, uh, the document. Um, but you know, it starts with that baseline. It starts with that 360 view. It then moves to identifying vulnerabilities and patches using some form of an OT safe vulnerability analysis. And then it's into the prioritizing, right? Which ones are the most risk, which are, which are on critical assets, um, which are on assets where I don't have any compensating controls. Next, then developing those remediation plans as well as the mitigation plans. This is where we really need to think about patching and the other parts of our risk reduction in an integrated way. Then eventually testing and deploying those patches and demonstrating and monitoring our patching as well as our mitigating controls on an ongoing basis. So with that, I'll draw the, the formal uh, presentation to a close, but I welcome uh, you know, any questions question and answer uh, session. So I, uh, if you do have questions, um, please, uh, please include those in the Q&A and I'll try and cover as many, uh, many as I can. So from Shaukut, uh, I hope I pronounced that right. Apologize if I didn't, Shaukut. Um, it means that we need to install some endpoint security software and it will cover all the mentioned tasks. So um, there is no need uh, to, when you say endpoint security software, I'm assuming you mean antivirus or something. Um, there's no need to deploy that. Um, our view is uh, it is one possible mitigating measure if you can't patch. Now, is that the only one? Absolutely not. Um, you could also uh, use configuration hardening. You can use network protections. There's a range of different solutions uh, that you could use um, instead of antivirus or whitelisting. Um, we're strong believers in whitelisting, um, but it, it's not a, it's not a requirement. Now for what I described in our platform, we do deploy software, uh, to, uh, to make what I described, uh, effective. doesn't mean, I, I think the process works, you know, frankly, I think it's just as relevant if you're not using Verve software, if you're using something else. Um, it's just that we built our software to essentially enable this process in a more, in a more automated cost-effective way. Um, uh, well, Koss asked if, if we're doing this, do we need an endpoint client to provide these functionalities? Um, we use, uh, an endpoint, uh, executable or, or client, um, an OT specific one though, on all the windows, Unix, Linux devices. So not on the PLCs, we use an agentless approach for those. Um, but for the windows devices we do, uh, and it's been, it's, we've been working, proving this out for 15 years. Um, on pretty much every control system. Uh, so we do deploy uh, that client on the Windows HMI servers and that sort of thing. But on the embedded devices, we communicate with them in their native protocols. So there's no agent, you really couldn't do an agent or a endpoint executable or anything on those. So we use a, a service to communicate with those devices in their, in their native protocol. Um, and yes, we can deploy the patches through Verve. In fact, it's way more efficient than using a WSUS or something like that um, uh, for that. Um, and can you configure playbooks? Yes, uh, it's, it's all very flexible. Um, uh, and the patching process can include application patches uh, as well. We can bring down those application patches and updates. We do not uh, automate the patching process for or the patching deployment for firmware to be transparent. Uh, so far, we haven't had a lot of requests for that. We could do it, the software would allow us to do it. However, uh, most people wanna use uh, the OEM tools uh, to do those firmware updates. Um, the main reason is in most cases, we're not, people aren't updating that firmware very often. And as a result, the efficiency gains from an automated process is not as, as uh, the trade-off of efficiency versus using the OEM tools and doing that through that process is, is not as great. Now, to having said that, 
um, places, things like um, uh, meters or where you have, you know, hundreds of thousands of video cameras, we can absolutely, you know, that is definitely technically feasible of, of using the software to update firmware of those. Um, however, it, you know, most of what we're doing is in the automation is on the, uh, is on the OS type devices. Um, and yes, we can manage application whitelisting uh, through the Verve platform. We have integrations with pretty much all the major OEMs. Um, so we, we've been deployed on pretty much every OEM under the sun. Um, and we can bring in their approved patch list. We don't, we don't provide those. Uh, the vendors don't, don't sell them to us. They sell them to our direct clients. Um, but in all cases, we can integrate those into Verve and, and import them so that you can, uh, you can see those approved lists versus the, uh, all, of the, all of the actual patches that are available. So with that, I will leave you all for today. We do have another webinar coming up uh, towards the end of October, and that's going to be focused on what are some of the changes that are ongoing in, in the cybersecurity insurance market and how is that going to impact OT security? Um, it's a big topic right now. Uh, it's driving things around patching and others. Uh, and so we're going to try and take a step back and talk a little bit about um, how to think about insurance and, and what's coming uh, that we ought to be ready for to keep uh, to maintain our, our insurance going forward. So I hope everybody enjoyed this. Hope it was helpful. We will be sending out a recording and, and uh, a PDF of the presentation as well. Thank you all and, and have a great rest of your week.